Uh, and yes, we're going to talk a little bit about optimization, but before that, I guess I should introduce myself as uh, a bit more. So the name is, is Gianluca, that's how you pronounce it. Uh, I'm at Microsoft in the Algorithms and Data Science Solutions team just now. I just joined them uh, a month and a half ago, roughly. Before that, I was with these guys here at the front, Longshot Systems, um, and Chris presented, I think, the session before the one before me. Um, so doing sports betting, as you might have heard. Uh, and yes, I also do some training and teaching and um, you know, for, for free or otherwise. Slides and notebooks for today are on my GitHub, so that's the link uh, where you can get everything we'll be going through. There's also a link to Binder. Uh, I'm using a few libraries which you might not have installed, so if you want to use uh, Binder, there's a link there that will spin up a virtual machine for free, which will run for uh, a few hours, so you can follow through the, the notebooks without installing anything at all. But we'll talk about this when we get to the notebooks. So, there we go. Oops. Um, so the idea, as I said, is to introduce you to optimization, and I personally think it's quite important and, and somehow underrated in, in machine learning. Uh, my background is in, in maths and computer science, and as part of that you do a lot of, well, I studied uh, operations research, so you do a lot of optimization in different types. You do continuous, which is some of the stuff we'll see today. You do discrete optimization. You know, there's all sorts of, uh, of sub-specialization of, of the field. Uh, and in machine learning, very often, I hope to convince you today, we do optimization or, well, scikit-learn normally does optimization for us and we don't really see that. But it's useful, I think, uh, to understand what's going on under the hood for two reasons. One is that sometimes, most of the time it's fine, sometimes uh, stuff breaks and you have no idea why. So that happened to me a few times in, well, in R, I have to say, not so much in, in Python with scikit-learn, but I had a few issues with packages that just randomly stopped working and gave up results that I knew were wrong and confirmed that were different softwares. So this happened to be uh, optimization problems. And also I think if you can take some algorithms and perhaps modify them slightly uh, to make them fit your problem better, then you probably need to understand what's going on under the hood. So that's, that's the idea for today. Uh, we're going to talk about four things, optimization in general, so what it is, just to set the scene, and as I said, optimization is a very broad field, so you want to kind of hone in into what's interesting uh, to us today. Then we're going to talk about linear and convex quadratic programming with some applications of, of this to machine learning, so we'll see um, quantile and robust regression, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see the elastic net penalization for linear regression as, as an example of convex quadratic programming. And finally, I want to give you, so this will kind of be the recurring theme, and it's also the title of the presentation, is follow the gradient. So normally, and if you've uh, worked especially with neural networks, uh, you know that stochastic gradient descent and or simple gradient descent, this, this is the idea that we should follow the gradient to minimize functions. But I want to give you maybe a better intuition of why that's the case and why that's so important. So I'll kind of assume that following the gradient is a good idea uh, throughout, but then I'll, I'll explain to you why that's the case. So we'll start with optimization, and typically in optimization you have a function, and we'll talk a lot about this function. It's known as the objective function normally, or in machine learning you might call it a loss function. Uh, and that's what it looks like, so it's just a mapping. You have uh, a dimension P, and it might take real numbers, it might take all sorts of inputs, but then it gives you an output. So it can be a black box or not, it can you know, be completely transparent and you can give it our inputs and get the output out. Now what you want out of this is the optimal input, and the optimal input is the one that minimizes or maximizes either direction your function, and this we call the X star. So whenever you see a little star, that's kind of indicative of the optimal. So it might be anything in machine learning, very often it's a loss that you wish to minimize, like the mean squared error uh, for linear regression, or something with the like the log loss, uh, and you want the best element or the best vector X uh, that minimizes or maximizes it. So, as I said, in machine learning, very, very often, this uh, we call a loss function, and what this means is that very often in machine learning, you're actually doing optimization, you're solving optimization problems, even though you're calling dot fit in scikit-learn. So for linear regressions, you might know that's the mean squared error, which is a function of the regression coefficients, the betas that you're trying to estimate. Um, this little hat is the estimation, that's the statistician in me, so you'll see many hats throughout. Uh, and you have your x, your y, which are given, and all you're doing is minimizing 
the difference or the square dif the sum of the square differences between the prediction, which is this y i hat, uh, minus whatever the data tells you with what you mean to predict. Logistic regression is the same. You're trying to minimize the log loss, which looks like that, uh, with uh, transformation of the linear predictor. Uh, by the logit function, but again, it's the same idea. So you're trying to minimize a function. And this is the reason why I think, you know, if you're doing any sort of machine learning, you probably need to understand a little bit about how this is done and, and what exactly is, is going on under the hood. So we'll start with types of optimization, and uh, the guys from Longshot are not allowed to answer this question because you've seen it before. Uh, this used to be one of, one of our interview questions. And... Um, <laughs> Just to give you an intuition, so you have three functions, uh, f1, 2, and 3, and they have the same uh, image so that they all map into the, uh, the real axis, so the output doesn't really matter, it's a number of sorts, but the inputs are different. In one case, f1 gets real input, so uh, it's any number between minus and plus infinity, and it gets a vector of 100 of them as, you, as their input. Uh, the second one is similar, but you're constraining the sum of the inputs to be one. So if you imagine this, it, they're basically uh, vectors in the hypersphere. And the last one accepts as input binary variables. So there are 100 binary variables between zero and one. Which do you think is harder to optimize and why is that so? So who thinks, show me your hands for number one is the hardest of the three to optimize? Okay, the first one, because the problem is unconstrained. What about the second one, who's in favor of second one? Not very many, okay. What about the third one? A few more, yes, that's the third one. Uh, the first one is actually interesting that you say that it's unconstrained, hence it's difficult. It's actually uh, somehow easier to navigate this space for reasons which we'll see uh, in a second. But yes, the third one is the difficult one, and we're not really gonna talk too much about this. Uh, today I'll just give you a quick intuition of why that's the case. Uh, but the, th the third one is, is difficult to optimize because there's no other way apart from checking all possible combinations. So that's uh, combinatorial optimization, which will come uh, in, in a little bit. Uh, in general, if you want to just create you know, or, or a framework or start creating a framework, and I'll, I'll use this uh, throughout for optimization problems, uh, this is what it looks like. You, the standard form is normally to minimize something. You can always decide if you want to maximize. You can always minimize minus the function. That's, that's the same. So you have, as I said, some input vector, which can be continuous or it can be discrete. Uh, and we're going to talk about a continuous case today. You have a function. I will assume here that we have a single function that we're trying to optimize. Um, so you don't have multiple objectives, which is also a possibility. And then this is subject to a number of constraints. You have some of them which might be inequalities, uh, some of them are equalities, and again note that in the standard form you have less than or equal to uh, because you can always turn one by multiplying by minus one into the other. So you have your inequalities, your equalities, and finally you have some kind of box constraints uh, around the variables, so the, the allowable, the, the permissible values. And we talked about the inputs. Now about the output, you, your function can be of, of any kind. It can be linear, it can be nonlinear. As I said, it can be a complete black box. It can also be explicit in the sense that you can write down the mathematical expression, and that's what I'm gonna assume throughout the rest of, of today. Uh, or it can be implicit in the sense that maybe it's the result of a simulation, and maybe it has some stochasticity around it. Maybe every time you run it, the results are slightly different. Those functions are incredibly hard to optimize because of course they jump around as you call them and as you try to evaluate them. So we're not going to deal with that. Uh, today we're going to deal with explicit functions and we're going to see uh, some linear and some nonlinear functions, but uh, limited to the explicit case. Again, in terms of combinatorial optimization, and I'll show you one example I'm going to be asked for today, even though it's, it's incredibly interesting, they're very hard problems to solve in general. And the reason for that is that, of course, you need, if you have, say, your 100 binary variables, there's no way uh, but to go through each and every possible combination, which is 2 to the power of 100, which is 10 to the power of 30, roughly, possible combinations. And this takes a very, very, very long time. Um, when you're faced with these problems, sometimes you're um, lucky enough that there are approximate algorithms you can use, uh, or there's normally ways around it to, you know, you can get approximate solutions. It's not the optimal solution, but it's close to the optimal solution. Uh, through relaxation. Again, something we're not 
output of compass today. In general, though, these are the type of functions we want to optimize. They're continuous, they're nice. This particular function is particularly nice because it's nice and smooth. Uh, and you can already see it has a nice minimum at 0, 0 down there. Uh, and it's, as you can imagine, relatively easy to, to get there. The general idea and the follow the gradient that's in the title is that you know, if you're trying to go up or you're trying to go down, you want to go in this direction that takes you to the top. And this um, particular slide will come back when we talk about constraint optimization as well. Of course, continuous functions can still be tricky to optimize. This is the egg holder function, which is quite terrible. It's got a lot of peaks and, and troughs. And as you can imagine, you know, trying to find what the v minimum of this function is is a problem or is much more complicated than, say, this function. The other thing which you can immediately see is that whereas the previous function had a single minimum, which was the global minimum, in this case you have many, as I said, peaks and troughs. So this is the other problem. Sometimes, and we'll talk about the conditions for that in a second, uh, sometimes your function will have multiple minima or multiple maxima, depending on what you're trying to optimize, uh, which means your algorithm can get stuck in, in local uh, in local points, local minima, for instance, uh, and you know you might decide that this point is a minimum, even though you have something which uh, is more negative or is smaller down here. So the condition that saves you from this is convexity, which will um, again we'll just kind of hand wavily introduce now uh, and go into more detail later on. The idea is that if your function is convex and these are uh, this is kind of very geometrically what the condition looks like. If you have two points and you draw a line between them, the function is below it. Same thing for uh, maximization, and it's called concavity, and that's literally the other way around. So imagine this picture turn 180 degrees on its side. This is the condition that uh, ensures that any local minimum you find is also a global uh, minimum. So if you do have, it, it doesn't necessarily mean there's, there's a single one, because there might be multiple global minima, but they all achieve the same value. And, and convexity, uh, again, is, is quite important for this reason, but more of this will come in a second. Right, so let's talk about the simplest possible uh, functions to optimize, which are linear functions, and this gives rise to linear programming. Uh, the ideas have been around for a while, and uh, the originator of this was George Dantek, who started looking into linear programs um, during the Second World War, and many of the problems that you still solve through linear programming in, in operations research uh, come exactly from this, trying to allocate resources optimally. And this optimally was particularly important, as you can imagine, during the Second World War. So he invented um, one of the possible solving methods for, for this. But before that, this is the general form, so you have your x, uh, and this x we normally assume it can be, uh, again, an integer or a binary variable, uh, but we normally assume it's just unconstrained. It's the real axis, and then we um, want it to be positive. So you have a series of coefficients. If you imagine these are, are both vectors, so if you imagine expanding this, uh, this is something like your c1 multiplying x1 plus c2, x2, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a linear function. It's a linear objective function, which is good, because linear functions are convex um, without any particular constraints on them. And then in addition to this, so in addition to the function itself, you have linear constraints. And these are expressed by this matrix. This again is the standard form. You might have equalities. You can always turn an equality into an inequality by introducing additional variables called slack variables. Um, so this is, this is always a possibility. Now, you have three possible outcomes if you try and solve something like this. And we'll see this in, in the notebook in a second. Uh, your solution might be optimal, in which case you found p point, uh, or you found the x star that maximizes a function. It can be infeasible, because of course you might require, so your constraints might be such that there is no single point that's optimum. And it can also be unbounded, which happens when you can keep on growing your objective function infinitely, so there is nothing to stop you from uh, get, achieving this kind of infinite maximization or minimization. Graphically, this is what it looks like in, in of course, uh, it's graphical, so it's 2D for humans limitation and understanding uh, higher dimensions than this. And in this case, you have two variables. And this green triangle you see here uh, is defined by these three inequalities. So you have 
um, these three inequalities are effectively the three straight green dashed lines you see. This is the region where you're exploring and your objective function is this red line. As it happens, and I think this is quite interesting if you're interested in this, this uh, a good exercise to, to see why this is, to convince yourself of why this is the case. Uh, the function itself grows, and you can see I've plotted a few, a few lines here. So in this case, we're trying to uh, maximize, and both coefficients are positive, so you want to kind of move towards the, uh, the top right corner up here. And as this function increases, if you imagine a line that kind of spans and moves through that green triangle, it goes up, 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 and at some point it achieves its optimum. And you can actually prove that the optimum is always achieved in one of the corners or one of the intersections of the planes, or in this case of the lines. So this was the idea. This is the graphical solution. As I said, you can do it for two variables, um, but more than that becomes a bit tricky. And this was also the idea of Danzig's first algorithm, the simplex, which just explores all possible intersections between the hyperplanes. So it starts somewhere, doesn't really matter where, and then starts visiting all of them until the solution cannot be um, improved. So that's the idea. As it turns out, it's not, it's a, a very effective algorithm in practice, but it's theoretically um, not polynomial time, which means it might, in some specific uh, cases, take very long to solve. So there are, there are other um, possibilities for this interior point algorithm of Karmakar does exactly this, so it travels through this green region till it finds the optimal point. So these are, in a sense, this is all to say, these um, types of problems are easy to solve. So you can solve them in polynomial time, you can solve them for millions of variables very efficiently. And this is uh, an important point which is not always uh, the case for, for others. So we'll quickly go through this and then I'll show you how to do this uh, using, well, I have a couple of examples for you. Um, so we'll just briefly, as I said, talk about the uh, LAD or least absolute deviations regression. And you might have seen this, it's, uh, if you've, I'm pretty sure you've all done linear regression before, um, and you might have asked yourself, well, why am I minimizing the squared errors? Why am I not minimizing the absolute errors? Which is an equally valid point of view. Uh, and in fact, it was the point of view of Laplace who lost the war against Gauss, who was in, in favor of the squared. Uh, residuals. So this is the same problem as your linear regression just with residuals which are now in absolute value rather than being squared. And as it turns out, you can uh, quite nicely remove the absolute value uh, using a linear program. So you basically um, differentiate the two cases of the residual being positive and being negative into these two variables u and v, and this gives you this linear program. The twist that I'm going to put on this before I show you how to do it is that you can also, by tilting that function, tilting that absolute value function slightly, so the absolute value function is a triangle, uh, and by tilting it slightly using this tau, uh, you can create quantile regressions. So you can, um, in a sense, estimate the, rather than estimating the mean or the median in this case of your response variable, you can estimate all possible quantiles of the response. So we'll see how this works now. This is the, no. since we're going into this, I'll show you. So this is the GitHub repo where you can download everything. And this binder allows you to launch that virtual machine where you can then run uh, the different notebooks. But I'm going to do it locally. So the first example I have to use just to give you an intuition of linear programming. And let's make this a bit bigger. So I'm using a library called CVXPy, uh, which I recommend. There are multiple options. Uh, there's Google optimization tools. Um, there's uh, a number of libraries, both in, in C and with Python bindings. Um, so it's CLP is the main library that's been developed by the CoinOr project. And then they have Pulp, which is a Python interface. Uh, and uh, 
different ways of, of using this from Python. I'm using this CVXPy uh, because it happens to have support for quadratic programming as well. So it's a kind of single library for, uh, for the entirety of, of the tutorial. And NumPy and Pandas, you probably know already. So what I'm trying to do is define what the best breakfast is, and I'll talk to you about how we do that. Um, I've downloaded from Tesco, as it happens, a number of items. So in this data frame, you have different breakfast-ish items. Uh, the energy per gram, the amount of fat, saturated fat, carbs, sugar, fiber, protein, salt uh, per gram, and then the cost, which is also in, uh, in pounds sterling per gram. So what I want to do is define the optimal breakfast, and in fact, this is the possibly one of the, the earliest uses of linear programming was defining the best diet. And again, if you think in, in terms of when this was all invented, the Second World War, this is of course about rations. And, um, but we can still play with it. So I've got some items and I can start looking at the energy content uh, per gram and you have you know, almonds and cashews uh, with very high energy content and fruit, uh, blueberries with, with fewer. You can look at the bar plot of cost per gram Cashews are very expensive uh, per gram, and milk is very cheap, at least in this country. And then you can start looking at the trade-offs. So you might be interested in how much energy do I get per pound, and this is the idea of where we're going. So if you do this, you see that granola is a very cheap source of energy, and blueberries are not, because they're, you know, there's not much energy in blueberries, and they're, very, they're relatively expensive compared to, to the rest here. What I would really like to do uh, in this case is I have a few constraints, so I know that I need for my breakfast, I have an, an allowance of 2,500 calories per day, and I want a quarter of, of that, 625, um, to be spent, in a sense, on breakfast. And I also know that the maximum amount of fat I should eat, according to the Nutrition Society, is 35% of those calories, and the saturated fat is 11%, and so on and so forth. So these, these I got from the Nutrition Society. And these define what the perfect breakfast is in a sense. Of course, you'll see that it, this is debatable, uh, but it's the mathematically perfect breakfast. So <laughs> it's the breakfast that, according to the Nutrition Society, is the best one with the items I have available. That's the idea. So I've got my constraints, and I'm saying, you know, if you multiply the amounts, so this x represents different amounts, uh, if you multiply this by the energy, then this needs to be equal to 625, which is my total energy. Uh, same thing for the fat, so I have a maximum amount of fat I'm, I'm willing to ingest in the morning. Uh, and same thing for saturated fat and, and all the rest. And I also have minimums, so I have a minimum amount of fiber I want, I have a minimum amount of protein. The important thing about this is that if you look at the constraints, they're all linear. So you're always multiplying x, which is your decision variables, and they're all positive amounts in grams of each item. Uh, by the corresponding energy, which is the energy per gram or the, you know, the fat per gram, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all linear constraints in the variables that I'm optimizing over this, this x. And then my um, objective is also linear. And in this particular case, I'm trying to minimize the cost. So I want, amongst all possible mathematically perfect breakfasts, I want the one that's cheapest. And Again, this is a linear, is a, is a linear objective because you're, again, multiplying this x, which is quantities in grams, times the cost, which is pound sterling per gram. So the total, this CVX sum, gives you the total um, cost of your optimal breakfast, and in this case, it's 71 pence. So the 71 pence gets you the best, mathem well, the mathematically perfect breakfast, and you can quite easily extract, so this solution of the problem takes very, very little time and you can extract the, the best breakfast, which happens to be 108 grams of wheat biscuits, like Weetabix, 40 grams of most of almonds, and that's it. So, well, you get, you get half a gram of honey as well, and half a gram of raisins. <laughs> um, but this, this raises a few interesting points. The first one is that um, you, because this is continuous optimization, you might end up with very small values, and we'll see that this pops up again and again. So you're trying to optimize and you're trying to, um, in a sense, fit this as much as possible within your constraints and you, well, you're trying to minimize your, your cost in this case. So nothing stops some very small values from appearing in here or values that don't really make any sense. 
And the other thing you can do is also check that your problem, uh, in fact, is, um, um, is solved correctly, in a sense. And you see that the energy is indeed 625 calories, and, and these is, this is the breakdown. So that's, that's your total cost. So this was the very first application. very first application was, I have a number of um, items available, and I want to allocate them, really, uh, in such a way that you minimize, typically, total cost subject to the constraints. The constraints are really the important bit here because they, uh, they in a sense, give you an idea of what's allowable, what's, what's feasible, and this, this is exactly what it's called, the feasible space, uh, amongst your solutions. So that's the first idea. Now, I'll present to you, and this is all the um, non-continuous optimization we'll, we'll see today. I'll present to you another problem, which can now be solved, again, using linear programming, but using integer linear programming, or binary linear programming. So this is now um, a, not a continuous optimization problem anymore. This is um, a binary optimization problem, a combinatorial optimization problem. And if you've um, studied computer science, you might know this. This is known as the knapsack problem. It is, again, very simple. And it's, again, about allocating things in, in, in a constrained way, in a sense. But as it turns out, it's incredibly more complicated to solve. The idea here is that you have different items and they both have values and weights. So you're trying to put them into uh, your backpack, hence the name of the problem. And you're trying to pack as much as possible with a constraint on the weight. So you have different values and you, this is all you're, you're trying to, to do. I don't really have any data. I just want to show you how uh, ineffective or how inefficient this is when you try and solve it. So I just have some random um, normally distributed values. The interesting bit is in this modeling. I'm now declaring my variables to be Boolean, so they're zeros or ones. And I have a total capacity of 100. So this doesn't really affect anything. But the interesting bit is in the problem itself. So in the problem itself, you're trying to maximize the value. And in this case, this again is a linear uh, combination. It's your decision variables times the value. But this x now is not fractional anymore, so it's not a continuous variable, it's a zero, one variable, which means, yes, I'm including this item in my uh, knapsack or not. That's the binary decision. The other thing you have is the constraint on the capacity, again, linear, multiplying the um, x by the, the weight, which means summing up the weight of the items you decided to include, and then making sure this is below the capacity. If you solve this for 50, uh, 50 items, it's fine, there's not really a big problem. Uh, it solves quite quickly. But then if you start timing it, this becomes more interesting. And I've timed it before uh, on, on this laptop for 100,000, 10,000, and 100,000 elements. So just going up in, in powers of 10, and then took, you know, every time you go up, uh, this goes up by 10 times, and you can already see, if I take the ratio of the times, this explodes very quickly. So. It's still possible to solve it. Uh, even for 100,000, it took roughly uh, a minute, 60 seconds on, on my laptop. But you get very quickly, you know, the next one up, which is a million elements, takes incredibly much longer compared to this. And I, I wasn't able to, to solve it on, on my laptop again. So this is the problem. You can scale up linear programs or continuous linear programs almost infinitely, as long as you have enough memory. Um, and, and even then you can probably solve it out of core. So you can do that very efficiently for millions and millions of variables. But problems like this, problems where you have uh, integer variables are suddenly much, much, much more difficult uh, to solve. So this is something to, to keep in mind. Algorithms are, again, different. They all look the same almost. It's just setting that variable equal to, well, Boolean equal to true. But it makes things much more complicated. The last thing I want to show you about um, linear programming is quantile regression, and I find this is a quite beautiful uh, example of that. So just to remind you, this is, this is the trick. Uh, the trick is that you have, you're trying to minimize, uh, rather than squared residual, you're trying to optimize or to minimize uh, residuals in absolute value. And the way you can do this, or the way you can split that function, which is nonlinear, um, the absolute value function, is by separating the contributions. So you want to minimize the total error, 
which is the sum of the u's and the sum of the v's. And this is your linear predictor. It's your x variables multiplied by the coefficients. This is what you want, your y. And effectively, this part, the u uh, minus v, are the residuals. The u are the positive deviations, in a sense, of the positive residuals on the, um, on the positive side on the upward slope of the absolute value. And the v is the other side, is the negative residuals. So that's, that's the idea. And in R, you can use the package Quantrek that does this beautifully. And in fact, there's um, a book on quantile regression by, uh, by the author of this package. So it's a very simple uh, data set. We'll look at is this angle food expenditure data from Belgium. You have income of households and the food expenditures. And this is what the scatter plot looks like. And you can immediately recognize a couple of things if you were to fit a linear regression line to this. The first problem is that outlier up here, and maybe this one. And the other problem is that this data set is not uh, almost cadastic. So you see that even visually, you can see that the variance increases as you go up in, in income. The variation in food expenditure increases as well. So a couple of problems that would make you question uh, a simple linear regression. So all I'm doing is defining my model matrix, and you've seen this uh, before if you've used scikit-learn probably. You have the intercept, and these are the values from your um, income. These are the value for food expenditures, and the interesting bit comes now. So defining the problem itself. I find that CVX by is quite, um, quite easy to express many problems in. It might not be the most efficient solution in terms of, uh, of actually solving the problem, but it's incredibly easy to get started with, with using it. So you're defining the variables. We have uh, two regression coefficients. These are the betas. And then there's that tau, which is the parameter, which comes into um, the quantile regression. And then you have additional variables, which are the u's and the v's. So there's one, u, uh, one set of, of u's and one set of v's. Uh, and there are as many as there are observations. So suddenly, I have two variables for the coefficients, and then I have two times the number of observations in my data set for these kind of fake variables that I need to be able to solve the problem. And this is not at all uncommon. So very, very often in optimization, you end up introducing additional variables which are not part of your problem, but you need to solve whatever it is you're trying to do. Then comes the objective function, and this is a pretty much a one-to-one -one translation of what you have uh, on this slide 12. So tau tam times the sum of u's plus one minus tau times the sum of v's. And as you can see, that's pretty much what you have. And the constraint is, again, the same. The other nice thing about CVX pi is that you can um, specify constraints, even if they are matrices and vectors, you can just multiply them. So the interface is very similar to NumPy. Uh, you have to use their own functions. Because this is um, you know, internally, this keeps track uh, of whether the problem is convex or not. So you have to go through matmol rather than using np dot dot, for instance, or the uh, at symbol if you're using Python 3.6. But apart from this, this is uh, a very similar interface. So once that's done, you can set your value for tau, and in this case, I want the median, so that's 0.5, and you can solve the problem. This is the final result of the optimization. This is the sum of the uh, absolute residuals now. You can get your coefficients out, but I think the best representation of this is in terms of the regression line. And this is your regression line, and I've plotted the same here, uh, with this red line being the least square solution. This is your linear regression line. As you can see, it's kind of affected by the outlier. And the, the green line is the quant well the median, in this case, regression solution. Now, once you have the problem, you can quite easily change. Say that now you want, rather than the median, you want the 25th um, percentile. That's easily changed. And quick to solve, by the way, while, while this thinks about the solution. Uh, I should probably say here that this is not the way you would actually solve the quantile regression problem. There are much better algorithms, specialized algorithms to, to do this. But the interesting bit is that it can be done, and this gives you an intuition of what it is you're actually trying to, 
to make, well, in this case, to minimize, and how you turn that mathematical equation into uh, a problem. It didn't like me for some reason. Where did it go wrong? Oh, it is no network. Try to. still doesn't like me. Right. If you manage to run this by downloading the file, then you'll see that uh, changing the, uh, the line means that rather than having the median, so rather than having the line that's right in, in between the points, you would estimate all the different responses for the different quantiles. Right. So this is one use albeit not maybe the most used uh, regression algorithm, that's one possibility, and this is what linear programs allow you to do. Um, but we'll see another one and the possibilities of, of convex programming in a second. Before that, we have a few questions, I think. Yep. Um, in that case, uh, why would you put anything other than the median? Because that's uh, it's a good question. So you might be interested, rather than in estimating, so when, when you're estimating, say, a linear model, you're trying to predict the, the mean uh, response or the mean y as a function of your, of your predictors. And the median is a commonly used one, but in specific instances, say you're trying to predict the, uh, the 95th percentile of latency, which is one application I've seen this um, used in. In that case, you might be directly, rather than say predicting the mean, estimating what the standard error looks like around that, and then using that to infer what the 95th percentile, assuming a normal distribution would look like, you could directly estimate the 95th or the 99th percentile, which can be helpful, again, if you're looking for the kind of maximum latency or maximum allowed latency. So you try and predict conditional quantiles rather than, or, or median, which, which is one, one of the quantiles, rather than the conditional mean. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, it is different in the sense that, so this is, this is all uh, very much non-Bayesian. Uh, in, in the Bayesian setting, you're trying to estimate the entire posterior. In this case, you're in a sense trying to estimate the conditional distribution or the, the quantile, um, the conditional quantile uh, directly. So you're not estimating the full thing. Of course, you might, you know, you might infer what that distribution looks like by running this regression problem with multiple quantiles. And in the if infinite case of running a regression for all possible quantiles, which there's an infinite number, um, you would recover the distribution effectively. Uh, but this is, this is more a kind of, I'm just interested in a single number, which is not a central measure like the median or the mean, but something else. Any other questions before we move on to convex programming? Um, what do you mean? You got single objective functions that were splitted into two. Yep. And then just added them to the standard error. Exactly. Yes, that's that's exactly the idea. So if you go back to the median, this is this is exactly the idea. Is this is just a trick, really? It's a mathematical trick to, as you say, uh, rather than having to optimize a function that's difficult because it jumps suddenly. You know, it's uh, it's equal to minus x for negative, and then it's equal to x for for positive values. Uh, and yeah, you split it into two and consider them as two separate cases, but then sum them back up uh, at the end. That's, that's exactly the intuition. Cool. Any other questions? If not, we'll progress to some, uh, I find more, even more interesting stuff, so that's convex programming. So now we add, we had linear, uh, linear objectives, so we had x, well, it's linear again in, in the coefficients, which in this case I call x, and you can already recognize this c transpose x is the same as we had before, so the linear program was just this part, and now I'm adding some quadratic parts, and this looks a bit scary if you're not used to uh, matrix algebra, uh, 
but all this is is effectively uh, Q and multiplying all possible pairwise products between your different x's. So you have all the um, the x squared and all the say x1 times x2, x2 times x3, and so on and so forth. And this one half serves little purpose. It's it's there as you can imagine when you differentiate, but they will come back later. So you have a quadratic objective. You also have quadratic constraints if you want. And now the question is, is this as easy to solve as the linear program? Because you know, the linear programs are always convex by definition because they're linear, so they're nice and easy. But this is now quadratic, which allows you to do more interesting stuff, in particular allows you to do um, least squares, the, the original uh, linear regression, which we'll see in a second. But is it convex always necessarily? So does being quadratic imply being convex? Who's in favor of, of this motion? <laughs> and who is not? So are our quadratic functions uh, always of, if you remember that parabola I had previously, that had a, a single nice local, well, local and global minimum because of the convexity, but is this always the case? Of course, that is one example of a quadratic function because that's uh, x squared, which is convex, but is this always the case? That's the question. I see a, a few no's, so why? <laughs> give us an idea of why no. Saddle points, yes, that's, that's the bane of optimization, is points where in one direction the function goes, say, has a local minimum, in the other direction it's a local maximum, so a saddle uh, is, is an example of that. And this constrains what you can do. So even if you move from linear, where everything was nice and simple, you move to quadratic, suddenly you start having problems, and not all functions are as easy to optimize as each other. Some of them have multiple minima, some of them have subtle points, which are not minima, not maxima, they're kind of strange objects where you might end up and not be too happy about. So we'll um, talk about all of this in this section. As an example, if you've used um, ordinary least squares, this is what it looks like. This is now the, the traditional linear regression. Same as before, but now we have the squared residuals. And you can rewrite this quite easily as in the same format as I had previously. So this is what it looks like. You have your coefficients and they multiply your x transpose x, the kind of variance covariance matrix. Then you have this second uh, linear part. And the last part is just the constant, which you can as well drop. It doesn't really make any difference. Interesting bit about this is that even if you don't believe for now that you should follow the gradient, if you do follow the gradient and set it to zero and see what happens, you recover the master equation to recover the solution. Once you take the gradient, solve for beta, this, well, first of all, note that the two goes away because that's, that's on both sides. This guy can pop onto the other side. This is how you get the second equation. Uh, and then this is how you get the inverse in. You multiply both sides on the left by x transpose x. This goes to the other side, it's the inverse and this is your traditional equation of, uh, of how you solve for uh, your regression coefficients. But this was an aside. Rather than doing this, we're actually gonna do uh, regularized linear regression, so we're gonna see rich regularization, and in this case, it's again quite simple to, uh, to write down, a bit less simple to estimate. So you have your lambda, which you normally estimate by cross-validation, this is just the strength of the regularization, and then this is the sum of your coefficients squared. By the way, this is one possibility. The other one is, is Lasso, which we'll cover during the notebook. Uh, but this is easier to, to solve manually. So what you see then is that in your objective, you get this additional term, which is just straight out of there. It's still in the quadratic part, uh, of course. So it comes up there in the quadratic part as well. And the utility of this, especially once we get to, to the example, is that in normal linear regression, you're not particularly interested in imposing any constraints on the coefficients. So your coefficients can be positive, can be negative, can be any number at all. But this doesn't need to be the case. You might want them to be positive because you happen to know that they're rates or they're intensity, there are numbers that ought to be positive. Or maybe they are between some lower bound and upper bound because, again, you happen to know that that's what the, the range of possible values um, is. Or you might also have some fancier, but still linear or quadratic, uh, convex quadratic uh, 
constraints. For instance, you might want them to be positive and you might want their sum to be equal to one because they represent some sort of proportions or, or probability distribution. So all of this is, is possible and all of this can be encoded quite, quite nicely in this framework. So what I'm using now is again, it's another um, data set, this is the Child Health and Development Study, and this is just to show you that you can do, you can effectively rebuild, and if you're interested in this, I encourage you to go through the notebooks uh, as well in your own, your own time, unfortunately. You're kind of, uh, even though it's an hour and a half, it's, it's time limited for, for what we are seeing. So you can reconstruct many, many algorithms um, just with CDXPy, and it's, I think, quite informative to just play around and change things and see how they break. So in this case, this is a data set from the Child Health and Development Study, and all I want to do is a simple, very simple, regularized uh, linear regression on it. I'm trying to predict birth weight based on a number of variables on the mother and the father, and some preparation of the data, but the interesting bit is, is down here. I'm doing my train test split, as is common, selected 20% for um, the test set, Preparing my data, and now comes the magic. So first thing I do is define my mean squared error. This is what you expect. This is my prediction, x multiplied by the regression coefficient, minus y, and then take the 2 norm and the 2p norm of that, square it, divided by the number of observations. This is just your vanilla mean squared error. Then I also define the elastic net penalty, and if you've not seen this before, the elastic net is a combination of the two uh, penalties, the rich penalty, which is the squared one we saw in the slides, and the lasso penalty, which is the sum of the coefficients in absolute value. So this is the first bit up here, is the L1 penalty, the lasso penalty, and the second bit here is the rich penalty, or the Tikhonov penalty, which is the L2 part. Then all I'm doing is defining my regularized loss, which is the mean squared error plus the elastic net. And this is what I want to minimize. And the really nice thing about CDXPy, again, is that you can define these as functions separately and then call it, say, well, optimize the regularized loss, and it will, of course, call the different functions and uh, being able to figure out that all of this is quadratic and convex and everything is, is good and nice. I also have uh, a variable here called fit, which defines the problem, so you can rerun it for multiple values of lambdas, uh, and I'm trying to mimic the scikit-learn interface now, so I've defined this L1 ratios, so I've got my betas, my lambdas, uh, and I want to minimize the loss as a function of all of this, plus the train data, and then I'm trying multiple values for, for the lambdas. So, Typically, uh, rather than having two different regularization strengths for the L1 and L2 penalties, you have a single one that then multiplies the ratio, or at least this is how scikit-learn uh, and, and the original paper, in fact, uh, sees it. So I'm doing the same. And then I'm just solving the problem multiple times. So in a sense, I'm implementing a kind of grid search CV of sorts. It's, it's a bit simplistic in this case. I just have a train test split, but it does what <coughs> you expected to do, and I'm trying a few values, so these are my data set, the train one, the test one. This first log space uh, is 10, well, it's um, 10 values between 10 to the minus 2 and 10 to the power of 2, so exploring a few different values for my lambda, and these are different values for my L1 ratio. So you can run this, this will take a little bit to solve because you're running the problem multiple times and you end up with your metrics and your test set and your train set, and you can actually plot them. Uh, and you see something which might look familiar. So this is a, um, as a function of your lambda value in log scale, and the different lines are the different values for the L1 ratio. This is the error in the test set. And this is the usual thing of, you know, um, when lambda is quite small, the regu there's little regularization. When lambda is quite large, so down here, the model tends to be a kind of intercept only model, so it's a very simple model uh, on this right hand side going down through the optimal models here in the middle to 
the overfitted models here on the left hand side. So you recover pretty much what you expect, which is that line of you know, underfitting, underfitting, Goldilocks zone where we're happy and the model is nice and generalizable and then going back up towards the, uh, the overfitting area, which is in this case on, on the left. So you can reproduce a lot of the stuff that you find and again in just that dot fit in scikit-learn quite easily and quite nicely. And again, in this case, all I want to do is minimize this loss function without any constraints, but you could decide that you want your regression coefficients to be strictly positive or strictly negative or any other combination of that, and this is easy to impose in this case. Any questions on this or this general idea of uh, minimizing, well, convex functions for now? We'll, we'll see now how this, this all unfolds. If not, we'll progress to the true meat of today, which is the intuition of why would you want to do this or why should you follow the gradient and I have a final application for you on, on uh, neural networks. So I'll go back to this slide and I'll spend a bit more time talking about it. So if you look at this a bit more in detail, you'll see that there's a boy and he's saying, bet I can find the top of the hill. He's blindfolded and this is important and there are fences. So this is a bit of a silly, <laughs> silly drawing, if you ask me, but it, it has a number of points. If you're blindfolded, and this is a kind of strange situation to be in, but if you're blindfolded and you're trying to reach the top of a hill, one very good strategy, and we'll see that this is in fact how gradient descent or ascent in this case works. One very good strategy could be to take a step to your left and see if you go up, and then a take another step forward and see if you go up, and from this just try to understand where it is that the terrain is going up. This will give you information, this will give you information about the, um, the kind of direction of the terrain and where it's increasing. Now the additional complication, which is uh, not often uh, the, the case actually in, in machine learning, is that you have defenses. So on top of just walking up uh, the, this direction that you found by taking a step to the left and a step forward, you also need to take into account the fact that you are somehow constrained, so you cannot walk up infinitely. Uh, at some point you're going to hit the fences and you need to stay inside uh, that region. This really, for all that it sounds a bit silly, uh, is the essence of optimization and the essence of, of gradient descent or, or ascent in this case. If you want more of the maths, uh, the real reason are the so-called Karish-Kantaka conditions that effectively say three things. The first one is that you need to be within the fence and there are subconditions for this which we're not going to. The second one, if you don't have constraint, really means that the gradient needs to be zero. If you do have constraint, then these enter um, this function through the Lagrangian, so this, this uh, with, the, with the Lagrange multipliers. Uh, and then for each inequality constraint, this is um, the slack duality. This, uh, this is the final constraint. But the interesting bit is the second one, I find, which it, once you discount uh, all your, uh, your constraints, so if you assume that, in fact, there are no fences here, the first one is obvious because everything is feasible, the entire real line, the entire real um, domain is, is feasible. Third one doesn't apply because there are no inequalities and the second one simplifies to just the gradient being equal to zero. So this is the necessary condition is that you should get to the point where the gradient is zero and this happens to be at the top of that hill where you get that red flag. So general idea is that just like the boy, you need to find a search direction, so you need to move up and you want to go uphill or downhill if you're minimizing, and you need to find, first of all, a search direction and then you need to decide how long a step you're going to take. This is all there is to it, it's too important. So the search direction is this S in which to move, and again, intuitively, this should be the gradient. We'll see why in a bit more detail in a second, but you know, once you've determined that if you move left, you go up by this much, and if you go forward you go up by that much, you know, you should be able to define, okay, this is where I am in the surface and maybe I should follow this direction, which is the direction of maximum ascent in this case, and that's, that's the green. The second one, and this is where most methods differ, really, this is, you know, the different um, methods for optimization, especially that you see in neural networks, Adam, Adagrad, Adam Max, all those. All that changes is how you take that step. So 
how big a step you take or how small a step you take, and does it change over time? There's a lot of research being done in how do you find this alpha star or what the optimal step size should be. But again, this will come in a sec. This means you need to compute the gradient, though. So you need, if you want, of course, to minimize or, or maximize the gradient, you need to compute it first. The traditional way, of course, is pen and paper. That still works. It's very painful, especially if you have big likelihood functions. Uh, there are softwares that help you. Mathematica does um, all sorts of fancy uh, symbolics, and, and Simpli, in fact, uh, is able to do some sort of symbolic differentiation. So you can do that. But as I said, it's painful. And I've done it before. I don't recommend it. Second one is finite differences, which we'll see uh, in a second. It works, but it's not great. And the last one, which is um, part of you know, why neural networks are now widely adopted is automatic differentiation. And we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail. So finite differences, the idea is quite simple. The idea of the, uh, of the gradient or the derivative in this case of just one dimension is that you do what the boy does. You change in one direction. In this case, there's only one because it's, it's a univariate. You increment by a small step, that's that little h, and then this is the change, up here is the change in your function, and down here is the change, effectively the change in your x, because this is the difference between x plus h and x is just this h. So to do this, you, uh, and you, you approximate your, um, your derivative by taking this finite differences. It's a single function call, because you probably know where you are, and you just need to take the step uh, and see where you end up and then compute this, this approximation, but it's not great. Uh, the error of this uh, is linear in the step size. So once you define what a small step size is, then this is, this is effectively the order of your error. A better way of doing this is rather than just taking a step to the left, is take half a step to the left and half a step to the right, and then take um, a sort of difference between the two. This gives you a better indication of what's going on in the point where you are. And the problem with this is that it takes two function calls. You now need to evaluate the function you know, half a step to the, to the right, half a step to the left, subtract, divide by the step size. But you get the good thing that the error goes down to, uh, or the, the approximation error goes down to a squared order. So you gain, of course, more work you do, uh, more precise you can be. So this is all good and nice. But again, it's not very practical, especially when you have millions of parameters, which is what happens in a neural network. And if you imagine having to do this in every possible direction, this means you need to call your function a million times every time with a different step size for all your parameters. And then if you're doing the approximation that's on your uh, right-hand side, you need to do this again to then compute the negative half step size. A better idea is to differentiate automatically. And a lot of research has gone into, uh, into this. The idea is not incredibly new, but the application is, especially to neural networks. So if you imagine a function that's composed, so you have an x, and then you're calling a function h on that, and you're calling a function g on the result, and then you're calling another function f on top of this, something like this. Um, you want to compute the derivative of this function, then this is given by the chain rule, which is really all we're uh, doing here. So the derivative of this composition is the derivative of f in g, of g in h, in h, in x. So in a sense you can, and hence the name chain rule, you can follow through the chain and you see that dg, uh, which is both in the denominator and the numerator, and dh is the same story, so they don't cancel out because they're infinitesimals, uh, but at the end you get the final derivative of f in, in x. The interesting bit about this is that it doesn't really matter which order you compute it in. If you imagine solving this, and we'll see this in a second, if you imagine writing this as a Python program, you would get a value of x, and then you would compute what the value of h is, and then you would take that value of h of x and pass it onto the function g, and take the output of g and pass it onto f, and this is your final output. And similar for the derivative. The interesting bit is that it doesn't really matter how, which order you do it in. So you might decide to compute this inner product first, which is how you would compute the value. So compute this first and then multiply. And this is called forward mode. Or you could do it the other way. It doesn't really matter. The results should be the same because this is all multiplied anyway. So you might decide to do this first in reverse compared to how you would compute this uh, if you were to 
um, to just evaluate the function in Python and then continue with the last one. So example to hopefully clarify this. Imagine you're doing your forward mode. This is how you would compute it. This is how you would compute your function. So x and y, you need to be given. They are the inputs to your function, which is up here is 3 uh, x squared plus the product of x and y. And I've calculated the derivatives on that first method, pen and paper, uh, for you so you can check that they're right. The way you would do this normally, again, in Python is find a value for x, which is unknown to start with, find a value for y, and then compute all intermediate results. You would have to compute x squared first, and I call this a. Then you would take the result of x squared multiplied by 3, which is this first part of the sum, and I call this b. Then you would take x and y, multiply them together. That's the second part of the sum. I call this c. And then finally, your f is just b plus c. That's the two components together. So I've just splitting down the function, nothing more. This is internally what a computer would do, just breaking it down to the minimal operations you can perform on a CPU, which is stuff like multiplication, which is a square, and, and addition. Now you can take derivatives of this, and I'm taking them with respect to box. And box is something, you know. It doesn't really matter what it is. It's a variable. The first two I don't really know, because of course I don't know what the values are, but then I can start computing derivatives of the chain. So if I take the derivative of a with respect to box, this is 2x, whoops, this is 2x times the derivative of x in the box. And this is just a pure application of the chain rule, nothing more. Same thing for 3 times a, which gives you 3 times the derivative or the internal derivative of a with respect to box. Same thing as before. x times y is the same story. is y times the derivative of x in box plus x times the derivative of y in box. And you just keep on doing this. Now, you can specialize this. You can say, okay, I actually want the derivative of f not in any random variable, but in x and y. So I want the results up here. I want these two. So you can just substitute rather than box, you have x or y. And suddenly this becomes very easy because the derivative of x in x is 1, the derivative of y in x is 0 because it's a constant, and the other way around for y. Then you substitute. This is completely mechanical. It's just a bit boring to do uh, and, and to redo in LaTeX. Um, but um, this you can do on paper, and if you, and I, I recommend you, you, you try this to just get the intuition. It's just very dull. The moment you start thinking about it, you get it wrong. And this is, you know, machines are great at doing this. So you just substitute things as you go along, and it gets you to the right derivatives, which is great. The other great thing about this is that you can do this as you compute. So you're computing, if I go back here, you're computing x squared. And you need to compute x squared anyway to compute the value of the function. So at the end of this procedure, you get the value of the function and you get the value of the derivatives together. Now, of course, you need to do this twice because you need to do it in x first and then you need to do it in y first. So you're still doing the work twice. You're, in a sense, getting the function value for free because you're computing incrementally, but then you're also computing the derivative in the same direction, hence the forward mode name. So you're getting to the end with function value and one derivative for one parameter, but then if you want the other derivatives, you need to change that, and you need to redo it all over again, and you need to redo it all over again. And if you have a million parameters, this means you need to do it a million times over, which is a problem. So now comes the trick. Now let's try to do it in reverse, which is not immediately obvious, but let's see how it works. Imagine now that I'm trying to do this in reverse, and in particular, what I have here, so this is what we had previously, this is what we had with the forward mode, now let's reverse everything. And note that since everything is reversed, this is the chain rule just being applied with the numerators now being the denominators, but nothing else changed. And you can do that because it's multiplication, so you can turn things around, no one, no one notices. Now, rather than trying to compute the derivative of my first variable x with respect to box, the first thing I try to do is compute the derivative of whatever I'm interested in, and this is now uh, a different symbol, just so you don't confuse the two, 
with respect to what I actually want in the end, which is the function itself. And of course, I don't know what this is, because that's what I'm trying to get to. But then I can invert all of this, and if you notice, this is you know, FCBAYX, so I'm just inverting the order, quite literally, uh, and inverting the order of differentiation of the, of the infinitesimals as well. So rather than you know, differentiating as you would normally do uh, in, in solving the maths problem, you're now doing it in reverse. So you're asking yourself in, say, this case, in the last case, what changes if x changes? And this is um, relatively simple, because if x changes, then a changes, because a depends on x. A is x squared times its derivative. And then C changes, because C is x times y, and its derivative is y. So you're doing this in reverse. And you can continue doing this and, and go up and up and up. And now, what do you want to differentiate over? We are interested, what we're really interested in is df dx and df dx. Sorry, df dy, df dx, which are up here. So these are the two we want. And they're kind of up here. Well, down here. So what we want instead of this lozenges, f, really. Now, once you substitute, this is magical. Because df, df is the same trick. It's one. Then you just substitute this, which is now working backwards. And suddenly, you end up with what you wanted, which are the derivatives in, of f in y and x. So in one step, you've now computed all derivatives of all parameters by a single function call. You cannot do this at the same time as the function call itself, because the function call goes from the inside, from the x squared, so from x and y, computing x squared, multiplying it by 3, taking x times y, summing the two results. So this is forward mode. And if you're computing the function value, this is still how you would do it. But what you can do is use this for differentiation and compute it in reverse, which would give you the derivatives with respect to both parameters at the same time. Now, if it's two parameters, it's not a big problem. If it's a million parameters, then suddenly this is much more efficient, because in a single pass, you've computed a million derivatives. And this is backpropagation. That's called reverse mode. But it's effectively what backpropagation is. It's a single pass that allows you to compute all gradients or all derivatives in, in one go. So back to the original problem. This was just differentiation. Now we still need to do something with it. And uh, the something is a method that was due to Newton. He said, OK, if you want to approximate a function, then one good way of doing this uh, is to use a Taylor expansion and just assume that your function is um, the second order approximation. So that's the function at some point. This is the starting point. And then you have the gradient times this difference. And then you have this quadratic form. And this H is the Hessian, it's the matrix of all partial second derivatives now in, in all possible variables. So this is what he started with. And if you solve this and you try to find what the optimal step size is, you find that this is the update. And in fact, this solves any quadratic problem in a single iteration, in a single step. If it's quadratic and it's convex, you start anywhere, assuming you're unconstrained, you compute the Hessian, which is all the second partial derivatives. You compute the gradient, which is all the uh, first partial derivatives. You calculate, well, you invert the Hessian, multiply by the gradient, and suddenly you are at the optimum. Of course, it's not that simple. And the problem is that the Hessian is a matrix, which is number of parameters times number of parameters. So again, if you have a million parameters, that might complicate it to invert or to compute in the first place. And then you have the gradient. So, this is mathematically nice and simple. If you have two parameters and you're Newton back in the day, it's a bit less simple if you have a lot of parameters and uh, need to compute all their derivatives. But this is the general idea. So people came um, up with uh, quasi-Newton methods first. The idea is that, OK, maybe. You know, this is the optimal one, but we don't really need the optimal one. We can just multiply the gradient by some alpha or by some approximation. And one idea, which is the BFGS and the reduced memory uh, BFGS, is to keep some sort of approximation of that Hessian and you know, solve this implicitly for B and then update it every time you uh, try and move closer and closer to the optimum. It's, it's an, uh, 
iterative algorithm, you try and get a better and better approximation of the Hessian. The other option is to just forget about it and just say, okay, we don't really care. Let's just follow the gradients directly and it will lead us to wherever the solution is. This will come later. Let's see how we do this. So the first idea of using the full Hessian was, uh, in stats at least was reintroduced by Fisher and he called it Fisher scoring so he gave it its own name uh, even though it's new to method. So this is um, this general idea behind maximum likelihood estimation is exactly the same I'm, and rather than doing linear regression I'm doing uh, survival analysis in this case just to make it a bit fancier and what you can do is define your negative log likelihood function which you want to um, to optimize and this is the beauty of it there's a fantastic library that's also used by PyTorch Autograd which will compute the gradient and the Hessian using reverse mode differentiation for you so all I do here is define the negative log likelihood function and then call gradient and Hessian and that's it this will do the magic for you I'm then using this minimize, which is uh, a function from uh, SciPy Optimize, using Newton's method, really, uh, even though it's called Fisher scoring. Extracting the coefficient, and if you uh, know or remember a little bit about your traditional frequentist inference, uh, the variance covariance of the estimator is given by the inverse of the Hessian at the maximum likelihood estimate. You can extract your standard error, your compute your, your Z values, compute your P values, and kind of get all the nice things uh, from the world test that you get with statistical models. So this is what it looks like in the end. I've got my intercepts, my standard error, uh, my Z values, and my P values, and if you don't believe that I did it correctly, I read it in R, just to see that I was right. Um, in R you have uh, the serve rec function in, in the survival package, and as you can see, this is actually the same. Uh, so all it's doing is solving this minimization um, problem, well, maximizing the, minimizing the minus or the negative log likelihood, which is maximizing at the end of the day the likelihood function. And this is what you get, seems to work, which is excellent. And as I said, this is in the specific case of you having not very many parameters, you being able to actually compute the Hessian, uh, which is in this case only four by four, so it's nice and easy, you can invert it, it's not too complicated to do. Now of course, once you move to bigger problems and you start having millions of parameters, it becomes a bit more complicated. And the trick here is to realize that what you do very often in machine learning is that you don't have just any problem. You have very often problems of this kind, where you're, you're trying to minimize not some strange function, but a function that's a sum of many functions which all look the same. So it's a sum minimization and each of these f might be you know, your simple linear regression model or it might be a very complicated neural network with so millions of parameters, doesn't really matter. But the only reason why it's different is that it acts on a different piece of your data. So maybe this one is for your first observation and then you sum it to the same one for the second observation. So you kind of assume that they're all independent uh, which is the, the typical thing of linear regression, then what happens is that your update, which was this very simple, you know, take the optimal step size, whatever that might be, and multiply it by the gradient, since this is a gradient of a sum, is the sum can be, you know, you can push the gradient inside the sum, so it's the sum of the gradients, and this is what you get. So the idea behind stochastic gradient descent is that rather than having to compute this on your whole data set, perhaps you can do this in batches or perhaps you can do it one by one, so uh, online or iteratively. So this general idea, shuffle the observations um, for, uh, uh, just to avoid kind of cycles, and then rather than doing this, as I said, with just one massive update, computing your entire gradient uh, for your entire function, your entire data set, just do one observation at a time or perhaps batch them up, and this is Eventually, you will do the entire data set anyway. This is known as one pass. And then repeat. So, kind of go through your data set multiple times. Of course, this doesn't come with a nice convergence properties that the full uh, gradient descent algorithm gives you, but you can do it on a lot of data. So, you know, it's, it's actually feasible. And 
The last question that remains unanswered before we see the, the application of this is how do you choose the optimal step size? There's no answer to this, uh, or there's no easy answer to this, rather, as, as to many interesting problems. Uh, you can pick a very large alpha, and your algorithm might just shoot off because you diverge very quickly. If you take jumps which are too high, then you might just tumble down the hill, which is not good. If you take very small steps uphill, this will work, but it'll take you forever to get there. So again, it's that situation where you want to be in the middle. You want something that's not too small, not too large. And the problem is that this often depends on the data. There's many, many ideas, as I said, uh, behind this that have been introduced to try and fight the problem. One is to use different step sizes. Perhaps when you're at the start, when the function is still relatively flat, then you might go a bit faster. So you might take larger steps. But then when you get close to the top of your hill, then you're going to start taking small steps, more smaller and smaller steps, just to approximate and actually get to, uh, to the, the point where you want to be to the maximum. Or you can use linear combinations of your previous update. This is to reduce oscillations, which sometimes happen uh, with strange non-convex uh, non functions. This is known as momentum, and it's something that's been applied, again, to stochastic gradient descent for neural networks. You can average out your results over iteration. You can uh, use different step sizes. You might decide that you know one parameter should move quicker than another one, and uh, this is the intuition beh behind many of the methods like Ada Delta, Ada Grad, uh, Adam. The general idea is that you want different step sizes, and the step size, by the way, is, is the learning rate. It's the same same idea. Um, so these are all possible approaches, but. What I want to show you before we conclude is how you do this. And I'm implementing now a full neural network. And well, I say full neural network, it's a multi-layer perception, it's nothing too fancy. Um, using the MNIST data of 110 digits. So if you're not familiar with this, this is the, the training set at least is 60,000 images, 28 by 28 pixels of digits. And what you want to do is recognize what digits they are. So flattening it out, normalizing a few transformations. This is what your output looks like. And then I'm, again, defining very simple functions. So I have my parameters, which is a, a collection of my weight matrices and my biases. And then I just combine them. And the general, this is the feed forward of the network. So you take your data, multiply it by the weights, add the bias, which is you can think of as an intercept of sorts. <laughs> pass it through the nonlinear activation. I'm using the um, tan h function in this case. You might be using you know, sigmoids or other, other things. And then the very last layer, I'm doing this log sum x uh, trick to effectively get something which is similar to a softmax. So the, um, the predictive digit will have the highest number in, in the output. Then all I'm doing is defining the loss, uh, and my loss is this y, which is zeros and ones, as you can see here. So if I'm predicting the wrong one, then I'm penalizing that, uh, otherwise I'm, I'm happy. And I also have a function to print out the accuracy, just so I can see what's, what's happening. I have another function to initialize the, the network randomly, and what I do is I have two hidden layers, one of 200 neurons, another one of 100 neurons, um, and some values, so I've decided you know, this, this is the Typical thing with neural networks, how do you define batch size and, uh, and all that kind of stuff, but I've got some magic values for you. And the final objective is just that. The only complication, and this is made easier by uh, the Adam implementation that's inside Autograd, is that you need to define your batch. And in this case, I'm passing of the 60,000 observations, I'm computing the gradient for 256 of them at a time. This is my batch. Uh, and I have a function that tells me which observations I should look at in each batch from the big matrix. It's this batch indices. And the objective does just that. You give it the parameters, you give it the iteration number, it finds which observations it should look at, it computes the loss for that, and just gives you the, the final output. I also have my gradient uh, computed, and this is the beautiful thing, uh, again, of Autograd. You just call grad of objective, and lo and behold, you have reverse mode differentiation or backpropagation effectively done for you. So I can start somewhere, and this is the first prediction I get, which is 
not very great, as you would imagine. So it's, uh, you can also compute the equivalent loss for this. And then what I can do is optimize this using Adam. Let me show you how this works. It's not the most efficient implementation, as you would imagine, but it does, it does the trick. Um, there you go. So I just print the accuracy at the end of each batch. I go, uh, sorry, at the end of each pass, I go through all the batches, uh, all the 60,000, and I start with a quite poor training and test accuracy, uh, but even a very simple model like this one, you'll see in the second iteration gets already a much better uh, accuracy. Last thing I will point out while this runs uh, is that all you need for Adam, and this is perhaps surprising, is the gradient of the objective function, not the function itself. Of course, once you know the direction, there's no point in knowing where you are, as long as you know where you need to move, that's, that's enough. So second iteration is 94% accuracy already, and this will run for a while and get to, I think, 96 or 97%. So all of this uh, is affected what, what is, it is doing uh, is backpropagation. You can't really see that because it's hidden away in just a single function call, but the idea is the same as, as the one I presented to you with that simple uh, two-variable function example. And this will, as I said, get you to, to 96%. So just to wrap up, um, general idea is that, you know, whenever you're doing machine learning of any kind, if you're doing a linear regression, if you're doing a fancy, or not so fancy, multi-layer perceptron, uh, you use optimization, whether you know it or not, so it's, it's behind many, many, many of the things we do. Uh, and I think it's worth spending some time and really understanding how it works, mostly because it can break, and when it breaks, you want to be able to fix it, uh, but also because sometimes it pays off to just, you know, tweak an algorithm that already exists. It's very difficult to come up with a new algorithm from scratch, you know, just something that's entirely new. It's much easier to take an existing algorithm, understand it, and modify it such that it fits your problem better and it works better on what, what you're trying to do. So that was all I had for today. The materials will stay up, uh, and of course, if you have any questions, in fact, before, we, before I leave you, I'll point you to some additional resources if you decided you really like optimization. I have a few uh, books. Convex Optimization is a classic one by the author of CVXPy. Um, Stephen Boyd. Introduction to Nonlinear and Global Optimization uh, is by a chap called Hendrix who first introduced me to this when I was studying maths in, in Portugal. So he's the one, well, ultimately the one responsible for this talk. Uh, Numeric Optimization by Nostal is a traditional uh, textbook and I also have a couple of online courses. CVX 101 uh, is also by Stephen Boyd. So you see uh, some of these names over and over again. But as I said, that's me for today. Thank you very much uh, for coming. If you have any questions, please feel free, of course, or any comments. And yeah, thank you again. Thank you again. Any final questions, comments, thoughts? Um, I think the con for the constraints, so the, the main issue, or the, the way I like to think about it, is that your objective function, the, the two main problems are the objective function itself, how difficult it is, if, it's, you know, if it jumps around or if it's non-convex, then, then it's tough, and the domain of your decision variables, of your x. If you're trying to do integers, or you're trying to do binary variables, then you're pretty much screwed, um, because you, know, you need to go through every possible solution. Constraints you can normally incorporate either with the uh, Lagrange multiplier trick uh, or similar ways, but there's um, effectively all you need to do is in your optimization algorithm is constrain your step size such that you never go outside the feasible region. Yeah. So in a sense of the three components, the function, the, the domain of the variables and the constraints, the constraints are the easy one or the easier uh, ones. Of course, you might have strange constraints which are themselves uh, nonlinear or you, you know, they have... Yeah. 
uh, which would make it more difficult. But they're normally not uh, the, the, the difficulty here. Any other questions or comments? Ooh, it's not differentiable is a tough one. Why is it not differentiable? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Cry. So if you well, if you're trying to optimize functions which are either very jumpy, like the the, the egg holder there, or combinatorial. Um, sometimes you have specific algorithms, especially for combinatorial problems, there's uh, branch and bound algorithms which are specialized, so they might speed things up. The thing is, we know they're MP hard, so they're difficult to solve, but it's still possible to solve them up to some large-ish number of variables. Uh, if the function really is, say it's the result of a simulation or something like that, and it's, it's very difficult, then you're probably then looking at global optimization methods, uh, and there are many there, most of them work on heuristics really. Um, some of those that were used you know, when, when I started doing this uh, and uh, you, you can find in, in the book I quoted are things like genetic algorithms where you try and exchange things or uh, simulated annealing. So all sorts of heuristics that try to get you to the point. Um, I think nowadays the, um, the, the newer developments there are in Bayesian optimization where we try and build, effectively rebuild the surface from sampling different observations and then maximizing or minimizing on the surface rather than on the function itself and sampling to reconstruct, uh, well, you know, sampling where you think uh, you have not enough information to see what the function looks like or what the surface looks like. So you sample there and then you construct a better approximation uh, in there. The idea is, this, this idea is, is not entirely new uh, in the sense that quite a few algorithms try and build local approximations of the function, um, for instance, a linear approximation or a quadratic approximation. It's like saying, you know, the heart is flat locally. It's true. And um, of course, your approximation ends at some point, uh, which is where they start going wrong. But um, it, it's a, a good first step to finding the minimum. Any other questions? Thank you very much.